Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about material selection. So material selection is an important part of the design process. As an engineer, after we have our design, we need to choose the right material for our design. James Stewart was the first professor of engineering at Cambridge University. At his time, there were only a few hundred materials. There were no polymers or there were no synthetic polymers. Now we have uh, thousands of polymers and there are at least 45,000 known polymers. There were no light alloys, aluminum alloys, and now we have several thousands of alloys. And there were no composites or uh, man-made composites, but now we can theoretically make infinite number of uh, composite materials by combining different material categories. So now we have access to tau hundred thousands of material. While this gives us the advantage of choosing the right material, but also is very overwhelming. It raises the question how to choose the right material out of that many uh, menu of selections. So here we are going to use Ashby diagram or CS software to categorize materials and uh, choose the one that works for our application based on our engineering needs. We can categorize material into three main category. I mean, sometimes it's uh, grouped into uh, five or six categories, but generally we have metals, polymers, ceramics, and the combination of them, which we call it hybrid. Glasses are usually uh, grouped under ceramics, Elastomers are grouped under polymer. Elastomers are uh, polymers that can stretch a few uh, multiple times of their original size. So the strain to failure for elastomers are a few hundred percent. Remember for metals, the ductile metals, the strain to failure is only 5%. But elastomers have the advantage to stretch few times their original length and they have their own application in different industries. Whenever I think of metals, whenever I want to use metals, whenever uh, we need high strength, high modulus or high conductivity, metals are our first choices. And within metals we can use steel, cast iron, aluminum and, and so forth. But it, they come with a disadvantage, they are very heavy and uh, when the weight is an issue you might look into other options the manufacturing of metal is not as easy as uh, polymers the cost of using metal is, is not uh, desirable either when we move to ceramics when high temperature is required resistance to high temperature ceramics are should be our number one choice they have a very good uh, temperature resistance so in a sports car, whenever you have the ceramic, you have ceramic brakes because they can handle high temperature. In aerospace application, when a shuttle enters uh, the Earth's atmosphere, it undergoes a very high uh, temperature gradient and the outer surface is made of uh, ceramic alloys or ceramic uh, composites. But again, they are, there is always a trade-off. The trade-off with ceramics is that they are very brittle, so they don't have any ductility and the manufacturing process is, is challenging. Uh, so as a designer, you need to look at the trade-off and see whether ceramic would be uh, an ideal choice. Uh, but also they are uh, very good for insulation. They are not as conductive. So if conductivity is not desirable, ceramics could be a good choice. Polymers, the main advantage of polymers is that they are very light compared to metals and ceramics, but they're not as strong. If a strength is an issue, polymers might not be a good solution. Then the other, uh, and also they are very good with corrosion, so they never corrode in, in, uh, in different environments. But they are susceptible to other factors. Some of them are not, uh, they degrade with temperature and they are not very good with moisture. Uh, composite is when we are trying to combine the two material category and keep their advantages and offset their weaknesses. So we said that polymers are very light, but they're not strong. So what if we add 
let's say carbon fiber to polymer so we can keep the light advantage of the polymer and offset the weakness which is which was the strength so now we have a carbon fiber reinforced polymer which is both strong and light and that's when composite comes into play so we tailor the material to our applications we put the strength where we want it so not only design with the material but designing the material uh, itself in the, your design um, process, first you have different, you need to think of the big categories of material, the family that you are dealing with. Is, are you gonna go through ceramic, metals, polymers, or uh, composites? And then once you selected your category, saying that, okay, I wanna go with metal for my application, metal would be uh, the right choice, then you could go to the subcategories. Are you gonna use steel, are you gonna use aluminum, titanium uh, and so on and then if you choose aluminum we have a different range of aluminums and different alloys you can narrow it down to aluminum uh, 6000 and once you selected that material you can go and check the material properties the density mechanical properties thermal electrical optical properties and uh, to see if it fits your application uh, these properties that clearly gives us a value, we call it structured information, and then there are some information that we do not have any uh, quantity for them, but are very helpful in, in our design, and then we refer to do them on a structured uh, information. So here I'm showing you an example of structured information for a polymer ABF. It gives you the general properties, densities, the price, uh, per kilogram and then the mechanical properties such as Young's modulus, yield strength, tensile strength, elongation, hardness, fatigue, fracture and depending on your application one property might be important than uh, another. As you can see there is a range of properties because each time we break a sample, we test a sample, we're going to get a different result. So there's always a variability. So you can either take an average of these two numbers that you see here. There is a range from 1.1 to 2.9 gigapascal. You take an average or use. But also in addition to the average, you need to pay attention to the variability. If there is a large variability in a material property, uh, that means that there is a low reliability. So depending on your application and the reliability that you want to use, you might use the lower number to be safer. And again, in mechanical engineering, everything is application dependent. Whether you're designing an airplane or a bicycle, your design procedure would be different. Your reliability level would be different. And here you can see on the right side, you can see other properties such as electrical properties, optical properties that are not associated with any specific number, but it indicates whether they are a good conductor or insulator. And here is a uh, honest structured information that gives you information about the uh, material and the design process and some notes uh, to give you some insight of uh, how to use the material in different application. And uh, if you look at here at the bottom, you have a links to process. So this is, this is the information that you have in the CES software. So you could, uh, in a CES software for any material that you're looking up, you can link to process to see what processes can you use to manufacture this material. Can you use injection molding, compression molding, casting, additive manufacturing, uh, and so on. So it links process to material properties. Uh, for processes, we have uh, four main categories. We have primary shaping, which would be injection molding, compression molding, uh, 3D printing and then you have the secondary shaping well if you have your material then you could use use machining like late milling and uh, machine your part to your desired geometry and then you have the joining if you want to join uh, two materials and the last one would be the surface treating whether it's painting coating polishing uh, that would be the last process of uh, your process tree so similar to the material uh, uh, process for uh, for manufacturing you have the family category which would be joining shaping surfacing if you are choosing shaping you could use molding 
in terms of molding you have different types of molding compression rotation injection and if you choose the injection uh, in the software it, it gives you a range of uh, value and uh, processes that you could apply to the size range the, the tolerances that you're going to use the roughness so reading those information will give you uh, insight whether that process is suitable for the material that you selected because uh, not only we have to select the material but we have to manufacture that material to our geometry if your geometry is so complicated maybe the only option that you have is 3d printing but also it's very expensive if you're dealing with ceramic 3d printing of ceramic is, is very expensive so as an engineer you should not solely look at one category you have to keep in mind all different uh, limitation and trade-off that you have and here in manufacturing process you have structured information and unstructured information but we want to compare material together because that's true that we have uh, we can have access to different data sheets but those give us numbers and words and uh, we want meaning we want the material property chart to compare out of these thousands of material with different properties which one is suitable for us so the best way is to plot them so here I'm showing you a plot of Young's modulus for different material so it's just uh, y-axis here is based on gigapascal you can see metals polymers ceramics and hybrids you can see metals of course have a higher Young's modulus and polymers have a lower Young's modulus here uh, because when we are comparing material from different category from polymers and elastomers to ceramics and metals we are dealing with a long range of property we use logarithmic scales so you can see the y-axis is as many decades is in a logarithmic scale we can cover a, a longer uh, range and here it shows the same plot but with more information we have opened up the groups of material so you could compare if you are uh, if you want a material with uh, youngest modulus more than one then you have to select the material on top of this line and you could plot these uh, figures in, in CES software. If you want material with high modulus, that's the group of material that you need to deal with. If you want material with low modulus, of course, you have to select the bottom part of the, the plot. But to better displace the material, we need to plot Young's modulus as function of density or weight. We want high strength per weight. So composites might not stand well when you compare it with uh, young modules of steel, but when you plot as function of weight, you can see composites are comparable with metals and ceramics. Because they all have higher strengths and also they have lower weight. And then polymers won't be the, the, a terrible choice either. Because that's true that their modulus is not that uh, high, but the density is, is pretty low. So plotting y against x for different property, looking at two properties at the same time would be very helpful for us. Here we are just uh, interested in the modulus and, and the density of the material. Similar to other plots, because we are dealing with a long range of material, uh, we are using logarithmic uh, scale. Here is the same plot, but we have clicked on each category to come up with the material that uh, that it encompasses. You want to select the upper right here, high young modulus and uh, high density. Here you can select a, a line which would be, let's say if it's a linear, it's logarithmic, so uh, you want to select the young modulus per density higher than a specific value, so you have to select the, all the materials that fall uh, on top of this line. And here is the same plot but with different lines. And you can see the equations of each line here. So here is e to the power of one third, but we are dealing with logarithmic scale, so this comes up as a, as a linear line. And depending on your design choice, you might deal with different lines. If you are only interested in elastic modulus as a function of the density, okay, that's, that's the line that you deal with. 
and if you want it to be higher than a specific value this line is moving up and down to meet your criteria similar to the mechanical property we can look at the thermal property the two common thermal properties that we are interested in is thermal expansion so when you're heating up the material how much it shrinks or expands and also thermal conductivity when you're heating one corner of material how it transfers uh, to the other part of material and it application dependent whether you want your material to be conductive or whether you want to be uh, have a very low conductivity to be in, for for your insulators you want a lower conductivity for thermal expansion for most application uh, we want low thermal expansion we don't want our material to uh, to expand or shrink significantly with the change in temperature unless you're designing an actuator which which functions on expansion and, and, and shrinking of the, the material and uh, here uh, we are you want to go through a selection process let's say you're going to design uh, a shed for your bicycle so to cover it during uh, winter uh, first you need to come up what are your design requirements design requirements we're going to list them as constraints and objective constraints are the ones that we use path and fail theory that you your design must meet those constraints objective you're going to minimize or maximize so for example here your constraints you want it to be able to be molded because you don't want it to be expensive molding is, is uh, one of the cheapest manufacturing method you want it to be water and uv resistant because you want to keep it outside so it has to be with a stand during winter you want it to be stiff enough so it doesn't fail it doesn't deform and you want it to be strong enough so it doesn't fail but also you want it to be as cheap as possible that's your objective you want it to be as light as possible that's your objective you don't have a specific value but you want to minimize that so that's an objective but for molding and uv resistance is a constraint if it doesn't meet those constraints it's not going to go through the uh, next uh, screening process then you have your material so you have your design requirements on one side you have the material attributes the process attribute on, on the other side which gives you information about density price modulus strength and durability so you're gonna put all the material through the screening process to make sure that the, the and you, you're gonna narrow it down to material that passes your constraints and that we call it screening and then once you screen and then get rid of the material that do not meet your constraints then you're gonna go through the rank you're gonna rank them based on price or you're gonna rank them based on weight and select the, the best choice for you and all of these are are, uh, are doable by CS software you just tr pass it through a screening process and pass it through ranking and it ranks you the best material for your application and you will have your final uh, answer so for design requirements you have function you have uh, constraints what essential conditions your material will, must be met then you have the objective so for screening process and selection process constraints are the one again that you have a specific value for it or you it has to meet and objectives are the one that you want to minimize or maximize you want to minimize the price you want to minimize the weight you want to maximize the strength but you don't have a specific number for it and then you need to know what free variables you have so you could uh, use that free variable your or your performance index uh, to find the right material for your choice then these are all your translation then you have your uh, solution so all the material that meets the constraint would be a solution but the optimal solution would be the one that achieves the objective as well the solution you will get a solution through screening and you get the optimal solution through ranking process uh, so let's look at a simple example here let's say you want to design a conductor for electrical cable so the length between the two poles is, is fixed you can't change that, that that's out and your constraints are uh, the length and the cross-sectional area and your design you have to design something that won't fail under wind or ice load 
so that means that you're requiring a ten specific tensile strength. Here, for example, you need 80 megapascal uh, tensile strength for your material not to fail. The objective also is to minimize electrical resistance. If you remember, the equation for electrical resistance is uh, rho, which is electrical resistivity, times L, the length over A, which means that the longer your wire is, you have more resistance, the, the higher the cross-section you have is in the denominator, so you have lower resistance. But you can't change L and A, you can only change electrical resistivity, which is the material property. So you could minimize this electrical resistivity and therefore your uh, electrical resistance would be reduced. So your free variable is your material choice because you can change the geometry. So you are gonna do a screening and for like only material that are higher than, have a strength higher than 80 megapascal, but you don't have any specific value for electrical resistance. So you're gonna rank them based on the electrical resistivity. Let's look at another example. Here we have a tie rod that is uh, under axial loading, F, and the cross-sectional area is A, the length is L, the mass is M, you have the specific density and yield strength. The first three parameters are geometry parameters, the last two are material parameter. Um, so the length is specified, uh, we, want, we want to make sure that uh, our rod does not fail under load F. So we, we are not looking at a specific strength here, but we are looking at a specific force. The difference here is that we have, we can, uh, we can play with our cross-sectional area. So it doesn't matter what is the stress as long as it doesn't, uh, doesn't fail. Uh, under that particular F, so we could increase or decrease A to get our desirable uh, parameter. Also, we're going to minimize mass. So mass, the equation for mass is uh, density times the volume, and the volume is area and length. So you can see area appears in both uh, terms. Here, for minimizing, we are going to reduce A. Here for minimizing, because A is in denominator, we have to maximize A. So you can see we have a conflict challenge here. For one of the criteria, we have to minimize A. For the other one, we have to maximize A. So for that, we are going to remove A from our uh, equation, and our free variable would be our uh, material. So if I eliminate A, I can write my M. That would be my performance equation function of f l rho sigma a. If I rewrite this one, you see that rho over sigma y would be my material index. And I want to minimize my material index or maximize sigma y over rho. So in this equation, we didn't care about elastic modulus or other material properties. The material property that we care is yield strength, sigma y. We don't want our material to go under plastic deformation, and also the density. And we have a linear equation. It's not rho to the power of 2 or anything. It's just a simple sigma y over rho. So on those plots that I show you, we can go and then draw this line and select all the material that fall above this line. Let's look at the second example. Here in this example, we have a beam. So the difference between beam and a rod is that the beam can have transverse deformation. So we are applying a load, the, the length is L, and then we have our uh, constraints and our uh, objective. The constraint is that the stiffness should be higher than a specific value because we don't want our beam to have high deflection. And if you remember, the stiffness of a beam or the equivalent of stiffness of a beam is relating the force with the displacement. So that's the stiffness equation that you're gonna have. And the objective is similar to the previous problem. We're gonna minimize mass. So we have area in both equation. We use the same approach. We remove the area between two equations. We eliminate it. And then we get our performance equation. So here I have put all the geometry parameters here and then move the material, which would be our performance, 
in one fraction. And if you want to minimize m, which means that I have to minimize this term. So here, unlike the previous equation, here we have rho over e to the power of one, to the power of half. So we don't deal with strength, yield, or ultimate strength. We deal with elastic modulus. So for this case, we need elastic modulus. That's a property that is important for us. Also, it's not a linear relationship. It's rho over e uh, to the power of half. So we're going to minimize this or maximize the, uh, the reciprocal of that. So for uh, material indices, depending on what type of loading you have, you have a different material index. If you have a beam or a shaft or a column, your material index would be different. But the software would allow you to choose, okay, one beam, I want to have uh, the this, this stiffness is a constraint, I'm going to minimize weight, and then that's the material index that you need to work with and minimize or maximize. Uh, finding the material index uh, would be uh, a task for you to look at your equations and find the proper uh, material index. But for a common geometry and common loading, you already have the material index. Here we want to see and use the material index in, in our plots. So we have rho over e to the power of half. Is m, that's our constraint, that's a constant number. We said that our plot is logarithmic. So I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna rearrange the equation um, and then take a logarithm of each uh, side. So here, now that I took a logarithmic, logarithm of each side, the right and left, you can see I have a linear equation. So you can think of this as log e, y equals ax so 2 would be our a that's the constant number the slope and that's x minus a constant number so that's a linear line in our plot with a slope of 2 so here I mean here c is a constant value and that's the line so this is not a linear equation, but in a logarithmic plot, that would be a linear equation. And that's another advantage of linear equation. And the slope is two, as we found here. So you can find values uh, higher than that line that would satisfy your uh, design requirement. And here you can see the line, different lines. So the equation seems on uh, non-linear but in logarithmic scale they're all linear and which line to use it depends on your uh, loading and uh, geometry so you can look at this line and then move it up and down depending on what is your threshold what is your constraint and this c value would be your uh, constraint so these plots help us compare material significantly and then in the see a software first of all when you are designing a project you are writing your report or presenting your results it's always helpful to include such plots so your audience know that you have actually done your homework and you have gone through all the material and you have narrowed down your material to the one that that you want